her borders essentially solidified and remaining unchallenged since the War of 1812, British North America would face its next existential threat, not from the United States, but from rampaging groups of Irish nationalists operating from, though independent of, Canada's southern neighbour. The Fenians, as they were known, would launch a series of military operations into Canada from various points along the frontier. The first of these, launched in 1866, focused primarily on the Niagara Peninsula in what was then known as Canada West, formerly Upper Canada. Hugely significant in Canadian history, it was one of the factors leading to Confederation, the forming of modern Canada in 1867. What became known as the Fenian Raids shook the populations along the border to the core. The regular forces of the British Army were withdrawing from North America as part of the Canadianization of its defence, and the Canadian militia, though critically underfunded and undersupported, would have to take on a greater responsibility in the defence of the Dominion. Part of this was the rapid rearming of the militia in the wake of 1866 with the latest breech-loading rifle, the Schneider Enfield. This would largely be complete by the late 1860s and in good time, as yet again, as the decade closed, the Fenian threat would loom in the distance. In May of 1870, the threat materialized as Fenian forces gathered near the little Vermont town of Franklin and launched an attack across the frontier. This would be met by the Canadian militia and the local home guard, known as the Red Sashes, in the shadow of a hill named after a local farming family. This hill would lend its name to the ensuing action, the Battle of Eccles Hill. The Battle of Eccles Hill forms the salient event in the Fenian Raids that occurred in 1870. While not a huge action in terms of numbers, it nevertheless was greatly significant to those who lived in the countryside and farms along the Quebec-Vermont frontier. Discussion of this important event cannot begin without some background to the first series of Fenian incursions, which occurred in 1866, and indeed who or what were the Fenians in the first place. The entire Fenian movement really is an outgrowth of the both the potato famine, the great hunger in Ireland in the mid 1840s, and then also the failure of the 1848 uh, rebellion in Ireland, which went along with the different rebellions, you know, all across Europe, liberal rebellions. And with both of those, you have this absolute burning hatred of England and England's domination of Ireland. And idea in New York is to form these men into military units, teach them how to drill with muskets, and when the time is ripe, to go back to Ireland and fight England on Irish soil. At the same time, Another of the young Irelanders forms the Irish Republican Brotherhood in Ireland with the same purpose. And they're connected. Basically, the Fenian Brotherhood is the American version. The big difference is the American version is open. The IRB in Ireland is all secret. And they start working together towards this, uh, both James Stevens in Ireland and John O. Mahoney in New York knew each other very well. They had been friends after the 1848. But then the American Civil War intervenes and the Irish in the North pledged themselves to fight for the Union. And interestingly enough, the Irish in the South pledged themselves to fight for the Confederacy. The, the Fenian movement itself grew during the war as more and more Irishmen joined the Fenian circles. Now, the Fenian circles was a system that they'd set up both the IRB and the Fenian Brotherhood that to keep 
their hierarchy secret and separate from the different layers. And during the war, they fight each other over here. And as soon as the war is over, they get together in a convention and they decide we've got to raise money to get arms. And Bridesburg is one of the very few, if not the only, former contractor who has enough guns to sell to the Fenians. And he sells them 7,500 Bridesburgs. And with those, then the Fenians decide, okay, we can go to Ireland. Well, maybe not. Because at the same time, there's a big schism within the Fenian hierarchy. A number of them look at it on a practical basis and say, well, theoretically, yes, we're raising this army and these trained Irishmen who've been trained through the service with the armies, both Union and Confederate, during the war, and we're going to go back to Ireland and tweak the lion's tail and fight the forces of the crown. But we don't have a navy. And it's very difficult to get all that across the Atlantic. And I said, well, why don't we just go over the border and take at that time, which was Canada East and Canada West, which is now Quebec and Ontario. Canada, of course, was not a country, but the, the two, those two colonies had come together administratively in the early 1840s. Why don't we take those and hold that as hostage and tell Britain that you can you know, give Ireland its freedom and we'll give you your colonies back. There were high ranking officials within the US government that while they may not have been Fenians, they certainly had an affinity for it. They had several uh, former Union Army generals uh, who were now serving in Congress, and they were very supportive of the Fenians. Today, it sounds terribly far-fetched. In fact, it sounds like a, a made-up story for some <laughs> historical alternative uh, history story. But at the time, it, it's, it wasn't all that far-fetched. And the Fenians certainly had the capabilities of, of pulling it off within limits. And the limits are what really does the men. The entire story of the Fenians and their machinations and their disputes within themselves has to be the most convoluted story I've ever studied in history. I spent my life professionally doing this and nothing's more turgid than the story of the Fenians. And if you can understand that, I think you can understand just about anything that ever happened in the world. Throughout 1865 and 1866, the Fenians began to formulate their overall scheme. Grandiose plans were drawn up for a multi-axis invasion of British North America, with the intent of attacking the enemy where they could, an actual invasion of Ireland being out of the question. The reality was somewhat less grand in scope, and when the first Fenian attack was launched in 1866, what became its main effort of sorts landed the Fenians on the Niagara Peninsula, with other much smaller and less supported incursions happening in Quebec. While not pre-positioned and waiting, the Canadian militia, backed by the still-present British regular battalions, were called out, and in June of 1866, they clashed in an action that has become known as the Battle of Ridgeway. There, men primarily of the 2nd Battalion, Queen's Own Rifles of Canada, from Toronto, and the 13th Battalion from Hamilton, later the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, along with other independent companies, such as the York Rifle Company and the Caledonian Rifle Company, clashed with some 800-plus Fenians who had taken a position up upon a ridge. The intent was for a more concentrated British and Canadian effort, with columns arriving in the area as they were able to. But battle was joined somewhat prematurely. The Rifle Green and Scarlet skirmishers deployed against the green and the blue of the Fenians, 
Initially, the militia, armed with their P-53 Enfields, with a smattering of newly issued Spencer rifles and carbines, made good and were able to advance and push the Fenians back to some degree. At some point, there were commands given and action taken that disrupted the militia forces, and soon unsteadiness and uncertainty began to show. Fenian fire was intense, and eventually confusion and to some degree panic set in, causing the militia to first withdraw, but then retreat in some disorder. While not perhaps the gallant expulsion of the Fenian invader that would have been hoped for, lack of Fenian numbers and support, as well as the deployment of further militia and, importantly, British regulars from Hamilton and Toronto to the Niagara Peninsula, proved the Fenian effort inferior and soon they were crossing the Niagara River back into the United States. Nine militiamen died in this action, with some 30 or more wounded. They were mourned and buried with military honours, and importantly, the day of the battle, the 2nd of June, became Canada's national day of remembrance, until Remembrance Day officially eclipsed it across the empire. Importantly, Fenian incursions also took place into Quebec along the Vermont frontier. While not as militarily significant as the actions in Ontario, locally it was a trying and horrifying experience, with Fenians occupying farms and villages along the border. Sadly, a civilian woman named Margaret Vincent was shot and killed, <laughs> fetching water during the night, mistaken by British regulars. Militia organization and decisiveness in the eastern townships of Quebec had been sorely lacking in 1866 with the militia deploying not to counter the immediate threat of the Fenians, but rather further north, allowing the Fenians free reign in the border communities. This upset many locals, and when the threat of Fenian activities loomed yet again some years later, they, distrusting of the government, would seek to take matters into their own hands. All along the frontier, the Fenians had left an indelible scar upon the border communities in particular. Thus, the first Fenian effort to invade Canada had ended in ultimate failure, withdrawing back across the Niagara River and also abandoning the communities they had occupied in the eastern townships of Quebec. The Fenian Brotherhood would lie low, attempting to regroup and rearm. They weren't finished quite yet. Canada did not rest on its laurels either. The raids of 1866 proved to be a seminal moment for the disparate colonies of British North America. The Fenians had proved that a combined and coordinated approach to the defense of the realm was needed, and the invasion proved to be a significant catalyst in the eventual confederation of the nation of Canada in 1867. In 1866, the militia had been armed with the venerable P-53 rifle musket, a fine weapon in its day, but by the late 1860s it was obsolete as new breech-loading rifles became the military standard of the age. The armament of both sides had been roughly comparable, with muzzle-loading rifles predominating. Moving forward, these now outdated arms would have to be replaced. Due to the increasing importance of the defense of the newly created nation of Canada by Canadians, the militia was rearmed with the latest Snyder breech-loading rifle, bringing a state-of-the-art weapon to the hands of those who would be charged with the defense of the frontier. After 1866, the Fenians, much like the rest of the contemporary militaries of the era, had understood the need to adopt breech-loading rifles, rather than the muzzle-loading variety they had used in their first invasion. The Fenians realized if we go back into Canada, all the Canadian militia is going to be armed with these Snyder breech-loaders, and we can't go with muzzle-loaders. We've got to get them converted. And so the Fenians go to the U.S. government and try to get the royalty rights to make their own version of the trapdoor, and they're refused. They go to a firm that uh, was an English firm, interestingly enough, the Needham brothers, who had an agent in New York City who was trying to sell this Needham patented breech loader to the New York State militia. It had been rejected. And there were, you know, scads and scads and scads of breech-loading trials taking place at this time 
with the U.S. you know continually trying to uh, see if you know if are we going down the right path? Well, the Fenians get the royalties, pay the royalties, get the rights to manufacture this Needham system and convert the Bridesburg muskets that they have, and then the Springfield type muskets that they had been purchasing when Irish veterans would be discharged from the army. Although the Fenians had secured a manufacturer for their new rifles, the Needham conversion they selected was perhaps adopted more out of necessity. I would say that when you're ranking the breech loaders of that period, that uh, head and shoulders above all are the Allen conversions with a trapdoor. That's the easiest uh, to put into the hands of a of a person who's never fired one before and, and make it operate and eject, extract and eject the rounds. Uh, coming right behind that would be the Snyder. And then a pretty far behind is going to be the Needham. The Needham conversion suffered from a few faults inherent to its design. While on the surface it would appear to be a relatively serviceable invention, its finicky extractor, lack of a positive locking surface, and differences in spec due to the clandestine nature of their manufacture would lead to difficulties when it came time to commit the Needhams to action in the hands of men who had never even seen one, let alone handled one. Its theoretical operation was straightforward enough, but each small detail, some of them deficient, would lead to an apparent deficit when the Needham faced off against the Snyder and the Ballard, used by the Canadians at Eccles Hill. Really, in 1866, it already decided on what this uniform was going to be. It was pretty much a Union shell jacket, cavalry jacket. It's trimmed, it, but it's in green, and it's trimmed in yellow. And it has either a green kepi or in some cases, a blue kepi with a green band. Um, I really doubt that uh, the Fenian enlisted had any kind of insignia on the, the caps. I think that they were probably just handed out, you know, as they, as they came out of the box. Uh, no one really knows, uh, but the, the reports are all speaking of the green clad Irish Fenians. So they had uniforms. Now, what happened to the uniforms? There's only one of them known to exist. And that's in the hands of Parks, was in the hands of Parks Canada, but it's now in the National Museum in Dublin. By 1870, the Canadian militia had made some advances, primarily in organization from 1866, but in general was quite similar in uniform and equipment. Nominally, the battalions of the Canadian militia followed closely the organization of their British counterparts. On paper, regular army battalions were made up of eight companies, each numbering about 80 men. Added to this was a small selection of staff, band, drummers, and pioneers. Most battalions of the Canadian militia were far from that standard. The militia was not a regular army organization and relied on part-time volunteers to fill its ranks. Due to this and the realities of geography, community, and location, units of the Canadian militia could be very close to their establishment or conversely be far from it. Companies of 20 or 30 men might be very common in rural areas, whilst those of city-based battalions might be closer to the establishment on paper. While the militia was under a national command structure by 1870, it's perhaps more important to examine the construct of the militia units that participated at the Battle of Eccles Hill, namely those from the Greater Montreal area and, most importantly, from the rural areas that stretched east from that city towards the border, known as the Eastern Townships. The militia of the Eastern Townships represented a typical cross-section of what could be termed wealthy city-based units as well as less well-off rural ones. Well, I think the first major distinction to make is the distinction between 
city city units, city battalions, which would have been Montreal, and the predominantly uh, rural battalions, such as the such as the 60th Battalion, a, a battalion such as the Third Battalion Victoria Rifles, which draws in you know, draws into the, the whole area around Eccles Hill, being a Montreal battalion, of course, was organized in a vastly different matter matter than say the 60th Battalion in the sense that they were a true battalion by by 1870. Yes, they may have contained anywhere from four to 10 companies, depending on just, just the amount of troop, the amount of you know, men that they had serving in the ranks, but they operated as a battalion. They were, the companies were used to operating with each other. They would attend camps together. They would drill upon occasion or parade upon occasion in the city as a unit. Uh, generally, they would have had more centralized command and more centralized areas for training and storage, which allowed them to have probably a greater variety of kit available to them. Whereas units such as the 60th Battalion or the 52nd Battalion, which were both townships, but you know, battalions that were headquartered side by side along the border, they were battalions more in the sense that the battalion was sort of an umbrella organization that drew in various companies, which up until 1868, 69 were essentially independent rifle and infantry companies. I can tell you looking at the uh, militia pay list for 1870 for the 60th battalion, most of the companies were in the 30 to 60 man range in terms of strength. And I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe they only had five or six operational companies in 1870. So in this case, the companies were typically headquartered within local towns and villages. And with the exception maybe of a one or two week summer camp, the men typically were used to operating within their company and semi-autonomous within the company. And we see this at Eccles Hill in the sense that where, where is the, the, the third battalion, you know, mobilizes in Montreal, takes a train, comes down to St. John's, marches to Eccles Hill. The 60th battalion, on the other hand, independent companies within the battalion gather and then march independently toward Eccles Hill to meet the threat rather than concentrating somewhere else because the companies were, were used to operating at that, in, at, at that level of independence. Um, and you just need to look at the, the de facto names of a lot of the various local battalions in the townships. I mean, you have the 60th Missisquoi. So essentially the Missisquoi County region, um, 52nd Brome, which is you know, the Brome region, um, the, the 54th Richmond. So Richmond was a relatively large town, but it encompassed a large area. Uh, you know, the 58th Compton, Compton was a huge township. Just to give you more of an idea, by the, by the standards of the time, we had one city in the township, Sherbrooke, and that would be where our only, well, I'll use the term loosely, but urban battalion would have been located, the 53rd Sherbrooke. And, and, and that battalion, of course, was probably, in terms of actual numbers, probably the, the, the strongest in the entire region. And it was very much organized within the town with all the companies grouped together within the same city with the exception of one that was in Lennoxville, which is a, a, a small town very close by. And when you look at the context of Eccles Hill in the 60th, you can see that it, it's really not that way. You know, this, this, this company arrives and then maybe this one over here arrives, maybe this captain will arrive, but he has men from two different companies because that's, that's where the men lived closest to him when they came. And <laughs> so by 1870, we were less reliant on British garrisons or, or, or more militia for Montreal than we would have been in 1866. We also need to take into account too that by 1870, British garrisons are being withdrawn from North America with the exception of you know, Halifax and Esquimo. The Canadian militia was generally kitted out with uniforms, equipment, and weapons that followed closely those of their British counterparts. Uniforms in the traditional colors of red for the infantry, dark green for the rifles, red or blue for the cavalry, and blue for the artillery matched their imperial cousins. As mentioned, in the wake of 1866 and the gradual withdrawal of British garrisons, the militia had been rearmed with the Snyder Enfield. This was a conversion to breech loading of the venerable P-53 Enfield rifle musket. The process was simple and did not change the size or proportions of the weapon. What it did was increase the rate of fire by more than double. The adoption of breech loading would see a paradigm shift on the battlefields of the 1870s and on into the 1880s, although it would take time for this new capability to be fully understood. Two types of Snyder Enfield existed, the long and the short rifle. The long rifle predominated 
and although the short rifle was to be issued to sergeants of infantry and all ranks of rifle battalions, especially in the early years, this was not always universally possible, although many period photographs exist from 1870 that show this had been affected. For this video, and hence its title, the Channel's Mark III Snyder long rifle was used. While this pattern of rifle was not present at Eccles Hill, the militia being armed with the previous Mark I Star, or range of Mark II rifles, the Mark III, with its locking breech block and steel barrel, does not exemplify any meaningful difference as far as performance or function on the battlefield. The ammunition for the Snyder was what had enabled a truly effective transition to breech loading to take place. The service's first generally issued self-contained cartridge was a 5.77 caliber and was packaged in packets of 10 cartridges, five of which were kept in a simple leather pouch. These were withdrawn as needed and emptied into the expense pouch, or ball bag as it was known for easy access in action. By the book, a soldier would carry 60 rounds in total, 50 in the main pouch and 10 in the expense pouch. The infantry of the Canadian Militia of 1870, including those units that fought at Eccles Hill, were clothed and equipped with accoutrements that were very much the contemporaries of those found in British battalions. The Canadian 1863 pattern infantry tunic in red formed the main upper body garment. This conformed in form to the contemporary British tunic, although it differed in cuff and shoulder strap detail. Headdress conformed to both dress and undress. The quilted 1861 pattern shako had been common in the early years of the 1860s and was still to be found in most units. This was supplemented by the much more common standard infantry Kilmarnock bonnet, which was knitted and fulled in dark blue wool. Trousers were of dark blue wool with a red welt, and the boots were simple leather affairs, often with the usual metalwork on the sole. Around the waist was a buff leather belt to support the 1861 expense pouch and the bayonet frog. On his back, he wore the 56 pattern knapsack with a blanket or greatcoat strapped to the back, and at least nominally, he carried a haversack for his food and other small necessities, and a water bottle. Not all of this equipment was provided, it seems. There could be startling discrepancies between battalions as far as their kit went. Whilst some were fortunate to have the complete issue, including water bottle, haversack, and shako, others had to make do with the most basic of necessities ammunition pouch and waist belt, as well as the simple Kilmarnock bonnet. One such rural battalion, the 60th Missisqua, which would be engaged at Eccles Hill, serves as a useful illustration of this dichotomy. What's interesting to note with the 60th, particularly, and, and it, it became quite a problem when you're actually in a shooting context, is the lack of an expense pouch. All the photographs show them wearing just their cartridge pouch, no expense pouches. How they were able to carry what I'm assuming were packets of Snyder ammunition in a tin line box and also have loose rounds in there and have to reach around behind you and not somehow spill them and get them into your right. I have no idea how they managed that in a, in a, in a field combat setting. And it, it's strange because when you look at photographs of many other units, such as the 3rd Battalion, Victoria Rifles, or a lot of the Ontario units, expense pouches generally are there. But in the case of the 60th, it just does not seem to be there. It's a piece of kit that they're lacking, and I have no idea how they manage in a combat setting like that. Of course, the other aspect, too, is when you watch or when you look at the period photographs is the total and complete absence of haversacks and water bottles. And when you read the period accounts of the members, not only of the 60th Battalion, but also even the Missisqua Home Guard or the Red Sashes for that matter, is just how terribly inconvenient that was for the men. I mean, they're continuously having to leave the line to get water and get food because the nearest well was, it wasn't terribly far away, but it's, you know, depending on where you're positioned at Eccles Hill, anywhere from 150 to 400 yards from your position. And when you read the accounts, a, a lot of the men weren't even in position when the Fenians crossed because they were off trying to find water. So only a portion of the militiamen were actually in position when the Fenians actually crossed the border because it's just there's no means to carry water or rations. I don't know. There is also evidence of the use of a relative newcomer to the panoply of military clothing. 
This was the undress frock, an alternative to the more ornate tunic. Right. Uh, this is the field frock. Uh, like you said, a simplified version of the full dress uniform. Uh, it's. Uh, no, I'm not sure when it begins, but by the 1860s, we definitely see photographic evidence of uh, both militia and imperial troops uh, carrying or wearing these. There were several patterns. Um, when I had this one made, I did not know that Canada then chose one particular pat pattern, the 1865 field frock. So this is uh, slightly different from it. This is based on one in a uh, Bedfordshire uh, museum in England, but this reproduces one of the versions of the frock, field frock that would have been carried. As mentioned earlier, those of rifle battalions followed closely the tradition of dark green uniforms and black leather equipment. By the 1860s, there was no difference, tactically speaking, between the line battalions and the rifles. They both were trained to operate in both close and extended order. The training of the Canadian militia was based on the contemporary imperial doctrine. By the 1860s, the full reference, the field exercise and evolutions of infantry of 1867, had been condensed into a militia-specific document, which tailored training and skill sets down to a much simpler construct. Focused on the company, with some attention paid to battalion evolutions. Subjects included basic foot drill, such as marching, turning, and saluting were all taught at the outset. Basic drill with arms was known as the manual exercise. This included all the necessities to carry the rifle and conduct oneself in accordance with basic parade requirements. Musketry was also a topic of instruction. The usual preliminary training including aiming drill, musketry theory, position drill, and judging distance were included. Range work was conducted as facilities existed. Some units had access to fully established ranges with proper supporting structures and facilities, whilst others had to make do with more austere environs and materials. Regardless, this training was based on, like everything else, contemporary imperial doctrine and teaching. It's my impression of militia shooting. Maneuver and the requisite close order company drill was taught in as much as forms and maneuvering required it. The customary evolutions of delivering fire by volley and independently would have been at least covered in theory, if not on the range. Tactics of the 1860s and early 1870s were still very much rooted in the past. However, the advent of breech-loading rifles began to see a realization that the ways of the past would have to be adjusted. In addition to this, basic skirmishing techniques in extended order were also the subject of considerable amounts of time. Especially earlier in the 1860s, independent companies had no ability to drill with others nor was this the intent. But as the 60s turned into the 1870s, formal battalions with their numbered designations became more commonplace, and basic maneuver at that level was addressed. Overall, the proficiency of any given company or battalion could vary considerably, depending on its officers, NCOs, and the time available, and more importantly, taken to train. It's a fair statement to make that some companies could barely function whilst others would have been quite proficient. As it was, the troops deployed at Eccles Hill would have had a basic understanding of the fighting paradigm of the era. As we shall see, their selection of ground from where they engaged their enemy would betray a modicum of tactical ability. The third grouping on the battlefield at Eccles Hill was of course the Masisqua Home Guard, known by their nickname, the Red Sashes. Now, to modern Canadian sensibilities, the idea of an armed civilian group formed for the defense of their homes, land, property and families might seem completely incomprehensible. In the late 1860s, however, it was a somewhat unfortunate, though realistic necessity. The Fenian threat was a very real thing. As previously mentioned, in 1866, the actions of the militia on the Quebec frontier, while perhaps militarily prudent, 
did not sit well with the people living along the border. The militia had withdrawn to a degree, seeking stronger and more flexible deployment positions further to the north. Unfortunately, this had left many families, farms, and other properties undefended. The conception of the Fenian invader took on ominous characteristics. Um, because there were a lot of rumors about the Fenians when we were first coming, that they were going to kill everybody, they were uh, going to cut people's heads off and put them on stakes. In you know, coming into town, uh, they were going to uh, they were going to kill all the men and, and boys and, and all the women that they didn't want. That's written in a in a diary by a, a young girl who was probably twelve or thirteen years old at the time, and they were basically terrified that these Fenians were going to be terrorists. Given this situation then, it's perhaps understandable that the local citizens saw the need to organize for their own defense. So, who exactly were the Red Sashes anyway? Some of them had had military experience. They'd been in the, in the militia, but most of them retired and had moved on. But uh, when, when the first raid happened and they were left defenseless by the by the, the existing militia at that time, they were very insulted and they were uh, hurt, uh, upset. They, their houses had been raided and, and things like that. So, but they were they were loyalists. They were people who had, who had been driven out of their homes in the United States and come to Canada, started all over again from you and had you know, pioneers. They were not people that gave up easily. So when they, when they were threatened again, they decided to take it into their own hands rather than uh, count on count on the local militia. Landowners were scared, so they uh, they ended up um, following a strong leader who had military experience, Asa Westover. Important to any armed group, the selection of a rifle was of paramount importance. So Westover was quite a controlling person. And he, he just wanted everybody to have a, a common weapon that was going to be a, a good weapon. Bought their own guns. They bought Ballard rifles um, with 30-inch long uh, barrels, uh, heavy octagon barrels. It's a sporting caliber, 44 caliber, but fairly accurate. There's a documentation where Westover purchased 40 Ballards, and then I believe they purchased a few more. It's, it's hard to tell. I've studied the photograph. I found a couple photographs that are pretty clear. And by studying the photographs, there are Ballards, but there are several different models of Ballards. And I have found some Ballards that were used in the battle that I can you know, trace the, uh, back to the owners to, to know that they were actually uh, home guard red sash Ballards. And they're not all exactly the same. Not everybody could afford a thirty-seven dollar dollar. Thirty-seven dollars in in eighteen seventy is a lot of money, so not everyone could afford it. Westover wanted everybody to have one, but you know he could afford them. He could afford two, but not everyone else could. And you'll see uh, in two of those photos, there's a fellow holding a ball repeating carbine. It's like the second gun from the top. It's a little short carbine. And it's very similar to uh, Spencer, only the cartridges of a Spencer go in through the rear of the stock, and on the ball carbine, they go underneath the barrel like a Winchester. So, it so it's quite apparent that although the intent had been to equip all the members with at least similar rifles, there were quite a few men who, through various reasons, equipped themselves with what they had at hand. Despite their hugely limited resources, the Red Sashes did their best to achieve a certain level of training. It's, there's, uh, there are uh, references in, in some of the old documents where they would uh, get together and, and take uh, have target practice training. And uh, even uh, Westover had training with his men, and so did Alexander Walbridge. That's uh, the reason that I found out about the ball carbines was a reference from a certain person talking about how they would train do their, their training and, and shooting with the ball repeating carbine. So people laughed at them. They, they didn't really take them seriously. And a lot of people made fun of them, but they didn't 
they didn't let that bother them. They kept on training, doing their drills and target practicing and everything else. And uh, then when the Fenians, they realized they were coming, everybody was pretty happy to have um, a red sash living next door to them. Uh, these guys were ready to, to organize and get together at a minute's notice if, if they heard the Fenians were coming. As you might imagine, the clothing and equipment used by the Red Sashes was basic and very much of a civilian nature. And at that time, by the early 1860s, the sack coat, which is the coat of this length, mm -hmm. is the standard for a casual wear for men. Uh, the the main the big difference or the big distinction was of course the red sash. And, hence, uh, hence their name, I hence, guess. <laughs> yes, and that was decided upon as a means of quick identification. Now there are photographs that show members of the red sashes with uh, pouches or uh, what almost looks like a military style uh, cartridge pouch. I don't know if it is uh, something that is uh, an issue or if it was uh, uh, made by a local. Um, tannery or a local uh, uh, outfit. For the most part, when you see photographs of the large groups of them, there isn't any pouches. They seem to have their cartridges in uh, the uh, pockets. Mm -hmm. And there is a reference in one of the um, write-ups about uh, the uh, outfit running out of uh, cape ammunition during the Battle of Eccles Hill, and uh, the decision was made to go back uh, to the home of Asa Westover, where there was a box of a thousand rounds stored, and that was being brought up during the battle. Nice. Notwithstanding the use of small numbers of other rifles, the Ballard formed the predominant arm of the Red Sashes. Its function was fairly simple, and its smaller caliber to the military Snyder aside, loading and firing of it was straightforward. First, the breech block was opened by pulling down on the lever. Then, a cartridge was placed in the breech. Pulling the lever up closed the breech block, and the hammer was cocked with the thumb. The spent case was ejected by first opening the breech block, then pulling sharply to the rear on the ejector. The sights were conventional affairs, using a rear ladder and the front a simple blade. The red sash activities certainly weren't on par with even the rudimentary drills and evolutions as practiced by the militia, but the enthusiasm and community spirit were obvious strengths. Shooting competitions were held, and generally the community came to understand and appreciate the effort put forth by this band of local men. Thus, with some rudimentary training in hand, healthy motivation, and reasonably effective rifles, the Red Sashes would see their date with destiny as the Fenian threat crystallized just over the border in Vermont in May of 1870. This brings us to the end of Part 1 of the Battle of Eccles Hill. In Part 2, we'll cover aspects such as the ground, organization, and the actual engagement to date, this project has involved more people than any other. I would be remiss if I didn't take the time to thank those who contributed to this Eccles Hill project. Ken Smith Christmas is a retired curator of the National Museum of the U.S. Army, as well as the National Museum of the United States Marine Corps. He's a prolific writer of articles on firearms, as found in The American Rifleman, Journal of the Company of Military Historians, and Leatherneck, to name a few. He brought his considerable knowledge and understanding of the Fenian movement and its arms to the project, and for that I am certainly grateful. Ken splits his time between Stafford, Virginia and Florida. Ross Jones is a local historian and Fenian raids enthusiast who has done an incredible amount of research and documentation of the intimate social and military history of the Fenian raids era and the eastern townships. He collects arms of the period and he generously allowed the use of one of his period ballards for the project. He also brought along Jean Plamondon, a good friend to represent the Fenians for part of the project. Ross lives in the eastern townships. Lauren Wade is another township man who brings a keen interest and knowledge of the local militia and Canadian military history in general. He is a former curator at the Regimental Museum 
of Les Fusiliers de Sherbrooke, the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, in the eastern townships. He contributed his considerable resources to assist in building the picture of what the militia engaged at Eccles Hill was all about. He also is a historical shooter, and in the guise of a soldier of the 60th Missisco Battalion, was able to add greatly to the project, bringing a touch of red to the actual battlefield locations. Branco has been a friend of the channel for quite some time, and is a longtime member of the Victoria Esquimalt Military Reenactors Association. In fact, it was Branco's Ballard that planted the seed for this project some years ago. He contributed his considerable knowledge of the material culture of the Home Guard as well as the militia. He is also an historical shooter and contributed greatly in some of the shooting evolutions and vignettes shown in this series. The Echoes Hill project has been a fantastic experience and I am grateful for everyone's participation, contributions, enthusiasm, and expertise. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.